So many of these solutions to climate change focus on consumers, focus on people in terms of their individual identity. Yet if we're going to make it through extreme weather events and an increased frequency, if we're going to make it through uh, seasonal changes that are disruptive to our food system, to supply chains, uh, and any number of other climate change impacts, um, we need to be more than isolated individuals. We actually need to be larger kinship groups that can support each other, that can provide mutual aid. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast, Season 2, Global Ecopolitics. This is a podcast for university students tackling some of the big questions in the field of global environmental politics. I'm Ryan katz from the University of Ottawa, and my co-host for the show is Dr. Peter Andre from Carleton University. And our guest for today is Dr. Kyle White. Our theme is environmental justice in the Anthropocene. Kyle White is George Willis Pack Professor of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan, where he teaches in the environmental justice specialization. He is also an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. Kyle's research addresses moral and political issues concerning climate policy and Indigenous peoples, uh, the ethics of cooperative relationships between Indigenous peoples and science organizations, and problems of Indigenous justice in public and academic discussions of food sovereignty, environmental justice, and the Anthropocene. And we hope to touch upon many of these themes in our conversation with Kyle today. Kyle is also the first American guest on our Global Ecopolitics podcast for this season, season two. Uh, so we want to get his take on environmental policy under the Biden administration at this critical historical juncture in time. So without further ado, welcome to the Ecopolitics podcast, Kyle. Great and good to be in conversation with you, Ryan and Peter. Fantastic. So uh, given how much we want to cover, we're just going to turn it right over to Peter to get into the first uh, question. So Peter, what do you have for Kyle? Okay, thanks, Ryan. Uh, Kyle, I'd like to begin by asking you a bit about your background. Uh, when we've interviewed Indigenous scholars in the past, uh, they often begin by talking about who they are, their nation, their tribe, sometimes a specific clan, as well as where they're from, their nation's home on this planet. And my sense is that this identity and the responsibilities that go with it are really important to how Indigenous peoples understand themselves and their place in this world. I have to say, I'm also left with a feeling that this is something that those of us who don't identify as Indigenous should probably be more self-consciously reflective about. We all have a history and identity and a place in this world, uh, but we're not all equally good at recognizing the gifts as well as the burdens of our histories and the responsibilities that go with it. So uh, before our interview, I looked up the history of your people, the Potawatomi Nation. Less than 200 years ago, in 1838, your ancestors were forced at gunpoint to leave your traditional lands near the Great Lakes and march down to what was then called Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, to start anew. What does it mean to be a, of a place-based people in the context of such dispossession? And how does this relate to the work you find yourself doing these days? Thanks for your question to start us off. So a couple uh, things just about my background and my understanding of indigeneity. So the first thing is, I think there's definitely a difference between, you know, what someone means if they say, you know, well, I'm Potawatomi. Uh, and, you know, when they say uh, I'm indigenous, I think they refer to different aspects of uh, someone's political, social, uh, cultural identities. Uh, so, you know, first of all, for, for me as a, a Potawatomi person, uh, you know, we're part of the Anishinaabe culture. And so while the particular, you know, band or group or community that I'm from, we relocated from the Great Lakes region, our homeland, uh, you know, as you said, <laughs> along the, the Trail of Death and, and stopped in a number of places, um, uh, to put it lightly, <laughs> but then now we're, our, our home is in, 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 in Oklahoma. You know, we identify strongly with, with both our Anishinaabe heritage um, uh, as well as with Potawatomi people that still live in our homelands. You know, there's uh, Potawatomi people on both the, the U.S. and Canada that 
uh, you know, whether in the First Nations context or, or, or tribal context, uh, we continue our connection and relationship with them. And and many folks like myself, we actually work in our homelands and uh, uh, work with Potawatomi and other Anishinaabe people uh, today. So we're a big group, we're a big nation that spans, you know, a lot of different states and provinces and uh, in, in, in federal jurisdictions, uh, I think that's an important part of of, of what it means is both a, a local sense of your particular Potawatomi tribe that you're part of, but but also the broader context of our of our larger nation and our larger uh, group identity. Um, but in terms of like indigenous, so um, so whereas something like Potawatomi means that one inherits the the history, the the kinship, the relationship tied to that particular community, the the culture, the language, the 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 ancestors. Um, being indigenous, I think, more refers to a political identity um, that's particularly relevant today. Because for so many of our people, we've been just overrun by uh, these colonial states, uh, the various corporations that fall under the governance of those states and and we're trying to to exercise our our political self-determination in a context that's you know pretty hostile to that so to be indigenous is i think to participate and have a stake in that identity of struggling to uh to maintain to advance political self-determination in this context where it seems to be that so many people uh don't want to acknowledge that you know we never gave up our right to self-govern and we never gave up our right to practice our own cultures and to uh to have our own societies and to engage in our own diplomacy uh so i think it's important sometimes uh and i don't think there are absolute answers to this but it's important sometimes to distinguish between what it means to uh, be claimed by a particular uh, indigenous people like Potawatomi and, and what it means to a certain indigenous political identity. That That's really helpful, Kyle, and uh, t- just making that distinction between your, uh, your nationhood and uh, the political identity, as you understand it, of being indigenous today. Um, We've talked a little bit about how the Potawatomi Nation was was forced to move, and and I've heard you make the case uh, in other places where you've talked about this, about how this maybe gives you some insights into uh, what we're all facing in the Anthropocene, where uh, global environmental change is going to be coming fast and furious in the coming decades, and this is an area that you work in, and I just wonder if you can talk a little bit about... Um, uh, your people's experience moving environments and how that relates to how you see uh, the challenges that we're all going to be facing in the coming decades. Yeah, absolutely. So indigenous identities that are tied to migration and are tied to kind of regional and, you know, continental cultures and groups and and trading relations uh, you know, are not often recognized. You know, so for example, colonization wasn't just a a process of dispossessing people of like one particular place. Uh, A part of colonization that isn't often recognized is that it also worked to to destroy regional and continental scale trade relations, or even in some cases, I think for some tribes sort of overseas trade relationships as well. And so colonization did only disrupt, you know, certain intimacies tied to uh, to you know particular places, um, but uh, but also disrupted people's regional identities and intercultural exchange and diplomacy and you know the creation of kinship relations across different languages and and, and, and different cultures. And so I think that's important to recognize that in terms of the you know indigenous environmental justice movement, you know we're not just trying to. Uh, protect f- places in a very local sense, but we're also trying to restore, you know, diplomatic relationships that are favorable and to restore our identities as people that might speak different indigenous languages and have, you know, different types of social and political relationships uh, across uh, different tribes and, and different First Nations and, and different communities. And, you know, I think for tribes that have gone through the, you know, the hell of forced relocation, there's a lot of lessons that can be learned that I think other people may have to confront due to climate change. And 
you know, it's really important to remember that when we were forced to relocate, we were also forced to adopt a certain model of agriculture and private property. And one of the things that happened, I think, in you know our history is that we actually learned that the type of private property that was forced upon us was one that eventually set us up to be vulnerable to economic exploitation, not in the least of which uh, occurred, at least for some families and, and individuals at the hands of the, the fossil fuel industry in Oklahoma. But to many other families, right, the sort of model of agriculture and so on was a threat to our kinship systems and to forms of relating to other people that demonstrated that there was value beyond just sort of the nuclear family and that if you really want to be in a society where there's safety and there's there's you know a a preparation for future risks and where there's there's well-being it, it can't just be a society where everything's located in the nuclear family and that the the most important relationship is the you know the marriage relationship you know just between two people and so one of the things that I think really comes out of this experience is that you know, we learned that even if we had access to the private property system, that that was not necessarily something that would work in our favor. And it was something that we could be uh, exploited by and that we needed to find strategies for how we could use the private property system to protect our communities and our collective uh, relationships to land. And so I think this is a lesson in terms of some of the solutions we see out there regarding climate change that are just sort of a recapitulation of the same types of capitalist relationships and that turn on a certain understanding of, of, of private property that's, that's really no different from the economic system that got us into this uh, situation that we're in now. And so I think that creates a really good type of skepticism um, that that just because somebody can create a solution to something that seems to fit within the status quo, that we should be very, very, very skeptical about, you know, buying into that. And another aspect of it tied more to kinship is that our educational system, our political system, our economic system, you know, is not conducive to creating conditions for people to have expansive kinship networks. So these are this is some of the way that I think about the lessons of relocation. And, and this is why for the citizen Potawatomi Nation today, there's so much emphasis that's still paid to the idea that even though we have you know, private property, we have uh, tribal sovereignty in a sense that's recognized by the United States, that we still need to build and strengthen our, our kinship and our collective identities, um, and that we need to find ways that the tools of the United States uh, can actually be used in ways where we can't be exploited, um, that we can support the the growth of our culture and our way of life uh, and our, our safety and our health as a community. Kyle, that's uh, quite an amazing answer and a comprehensive answer to a very big question. <laughs> so we, we we do that a lot on this podcast, throw out very big questions, but all our guests do such a great job of, of bringing it back. Um, so thank you for that. I was really struck by the idea of a kinship network. What do you really mean by a kinship network? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, for me, a, a kinship relationship refers to relationships that reflect really strong qualities of, of consent and reciprocity and uh, accountability and, 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 and other things, transparency, you know, respect for privacy, trust. And so a, a kinship relationship, and there's different spheres of them, right, from the like more intimate family relationships um, to your professional relationships, your political relationships, um, but they're ones in which you can really count on the other person to, where, where you actually know that that person really takes to heart your consent um, and that they wouldn't do anything without your consent. Um, and if they ever had to act quickly on your behalf, there's so much trust there that they would behave correctly. So so kinship qualities are ones that, that really mark relationships that uh, that that represent not only the very best of our our friendships or our, our our cousin relationships or our sibling relationships or our professional relationships, but they're also the ones that we really need when we're trying to adapt to different risks 
um, that we face, right? If you have, you know, good kinship relationships, then, you know, you're going to get people that if they find out that there's a health issue on the horizon, they'll tell all their kin. Um, or if you have an emergency, you know, who do you call you? You call your kin when you need help immediately. Now, the problem is, is that in our current formation in the United States, um, we're not really taught the importance of kinship. We're, we're kind of taught that our most, you know, important relationship is our immediate sort of, you know, marital relationship. Um, when, when you think about a, a kinship network, we're actually you would have extremely valuable relationships with aunts or uncles or cousins, or even in the workplace, you'd cultivate relationships that were really based on consent and trust and so on. Then you'd have a stronger network of people, which would mean that you wouldn't just have to rely on, you know, one or two of your very closest, most, you know, you know intimate uh, friendships or marital or spousal type of relationships. Um, and so for there to be a broad kinship, you need things like ceremonies, you need things like annual activities for people to renew and, and even establish or strengthen those kinship relationships. And we just don't have a lot of those, you know, activities. I feel like uh, so much of what we're, we're pushed to do in, you know, like in the, a kind of a mainstream US context is look to entertainment, you know, things that we watch or consume. Um, and appreciate for whatever their intellectual or, you know, <laughs> artistic merits are. Uh, but those aren't really kinship building activities. And it's, you know, it, the kinship activities instead are the the ceremonies, the collective practices, the, the, the events where people expect to come together and renew the, the, the parts of their bonds that, that, that matter the most to them. And again, when you look at emergency situations, um, it, you know, it's the people that you have those types of relationships with that can really come through for you and, and you can come through for them. So, Kyle, I'm wondering if you can ground this for us back to global politics a little bit. A lot of your work seems to be about bridging indigenous ways of knowing and Western science and between indigenous governments and settler governments like those of the United States and Canada. And you also factor in work at the transnational level, for instance, uh, at the United Nations. So is this a, a, a window to ground what you're talking about in terms of kinship relationships? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think uh, there is a misunderstanding, you know, globally about what uh, kind of indigenous global governance really means. And I think the misunderstanding is sort of this mental model that when indigenous people engage at the level of the United Nations or at the level of the, the nation state, that what they're sort of doing is bringing local concerns for relief to an authority that could uh, offer certain avenues for providing that that relief or provide, you know, publicity or or, you know, increase awareness or something like that. And while it's certainly true, right, that that is, you know, is something that that the, the United Nations may expect that it is doing when uh, different indigenous people go to, say, permanent forum or, or expert mechanism. Uh, but on the other hand, right, you know, it's important to recall that if we think about the history of our, our ancestors, you know, we were already people that had local and global identities. We're already involved in advanced trade networks and, you know, indigenous people were, you know, multilingual and had multicultural families. And, you know, the more we learn about the history, the more it opens up uh, some things that are not taught that widely in school about just how broad our identities were and, and not just through trade, but through, you know, other intercultural types of relationships. Um, and you know, this is why, you know, some historians talk about, you know, Michael Whitkin being one of them, uh, uh, you know, talk about the fact that indigenous societies, when faced with the onslaught of colonialism, were able to expand and contract um, and to switch regions and locations and to be quite flexible in terms of dealing with the threats that they were facing. And that's precisely because we had those local and extended kinship networks. Uh, and they were ones that were so strong that it allowed us to be able to respond to the horrors of colonialism uh, in ways that, you know, protected our communities and, 
made it possible for at least some of our communities to be able to continue uh, to this day, and we will continue into the future. And so in terms of global governance, um, you know, I think the indigenous environmental justice movement, but many other environmental justice movements is that we're actually trying to restore and recover those regional, continental, and global relationships. Um, you know, we're not just trying to uh, seek relief at uh, higher and higher global levels, but we're trying to create a system where we can also model what does it mean to exercise kinship when we're talking about groups that are thousands and thousands of miles uh, from each other. And so, you know, I've been part of efforts to build diplomacy, for example, between uh, Anishinaabe and Maori people um, and to find ways to create those global connections so that we can empower our movements, but not just in a sense of like interest based politics, like we have the same interests, um, but actually in terms of genuine intercultural understanding and genuine uh, reliance on each other and the development of, of trust and, and consent and, and reciprocity. Uh, so in this way, I think that, you know, indigenous global governance, um, you know, really has to do with restoring intercultural, interpolitical relationships across indigenous people uh, that can model a very different way of thinking about how diverse groups can relate to each other beyond the most basic, you know, elements of their political or economic interests. Kyle, th this is really interesting and, and a whole different way about thinking about global environmental justice than I have to admit that I've, I've thought about to, to date. And I wonder if you could just, you know, for, for some of the students who, for whom this is a new way of thinking about it as well, how would you, how do you define environmental justice? Yeah, thanks for your question. You know, I've I've thought long and hard about <laughs> the, the the best ways to, you know, to think about the meaning of environmental justice uh, in thinking through, you know, not only indigenous perspectives but the situations that you know indigenous people face. And you know, the way that I've kind of approached it is that, you know, for any individual, our our sustenance, you know, and and by sustenance, I don't just mean our Basic nutrition and and healthcare, but you know our our, our cultural meaning uh, and our, uh, our our wellness, uh, whether that's a psychological type of wellness or or a, a physical type of wellness. But but regardless, whether we have or enjoy you know any of those those things, you know, has to do with the different you know collectives that were. Uh, that we're plugged into, whether that's whether a collective is our, our tribe or a nation, or, or depending on the culture, right? It could be one's gender, or it could be a particular cultural identity. But all of us are sort of mixtures of different uh, identities that are our collective, and that what we rely on for some of those, you know, good things that I was talking about earlier, uh, really have to do with what. Um, these other people that we're connected with through these collectives do and and and, and how they're behaving and uh, and how they're related to us uh, systematically. And for a lot of indigenous people, these collectives are not only human collectives, but are actual, you know, ecosystems uh, in a certain sense, you know, so different uh, human and more than human agencies and spiritualities and uh, personalities. And, you know, obviously it depends on the, the culture, right? But there's this idea that what it means to, to benefit from being a member of a, a collective has to do with the, the landed relationships. If you live in an environment where your culture is reflected in how the ecosystem is, uh, and when you practice your culture, you can learn more about the ecosystem and, and how to protect it, um, you know, and that the ecosystem provides reciprocal benefits, right? I mean, my, my cultural activities, uh, you know, strengthen the cleanliness of, of water, then the, you know, the cleanliness of water is going to affect uh, me directly, but might also affect plants or animals or, or others that that also benefit me. And so anyways, you know, uh, Nishinaabe scholars, but many other indigenous scholars focus so much on on reciprocity and, and responsibility across humans and non-humans. But I think part of the point that they're that they're making um, is that, you know, these these collectives are environmental and there are ecological systems that you really can't disentangle from our, our social relationships. And so in environmental injustice, 
is basically what what happens when you know some other collective or, or some other society or or individuals within another collective or society when they really want something from whatever collective relationships that that you have and instead of engaging in diplomacy instead of establishing kinship uh, what they do is just try to steal it from you and so they essentially steal they take those aspects of the landed relationships that you have that you need for those you know benefits right from uh, uh, those collective identities um, and they use those as resources um, and they use those resources in ways that make sense to them in terms of their goals and aspirations and they don't care about what what you need or you know they don't care about doing so in a way that is fair or that is mutually beneficial or that's reciprocal right they're not establishing kinship and so in this way you know environmental injustice is often a a fairly parasitic type of relationship and its ultimate goal at least for the perpetrators of injustice is to weaken the society that is experiencing the injustice to the point where it can no longer adapt to the threats of the society that's committing the injustice. And so environmental injustice is not only a, a delivery of, of harms and violence, uh, but it's also an attempt to weaken the capacity of the uh, afflicted party to respond. And so in this way, right, you know, to say that one can create environmental justice by, you know, financial compensation or by just uh, stopping the amount of pollution that, you know, another group is experiencing or, or telling people in that group just not to be exposed anymore to, you know, engage in, in activities of refraining from being exposed uh, and a number of other of, of, of false types of, of solutions um, don't actually address the underlying aspect that the perpetrators of injustice are undermining the the political capacities, the economic capacities, the social capacities. Um, so for example, if if I'm told not to exercise my traditional diet because it's polluted, you know, and this is something that comes out of the experience of many indigenous people, including the Shinabe people, but Haudenosaunee people and others, if you're told you can't eat your traditional diet because it's contaminated from an industrial facility, um, then what diet do you have to fall back on? Um, and is it a diet that's healthier than the polluted traditional diet? And if you go to that diet, right, you know, eating industrial processed foods, you don't get in a traditional way. Do you get the family benefits? Do you get the the societal benefits of that? Um, do you get the environmental stewardship that went into that? No, you don't. Um, and so in that way, it's not really a solution and can set people up for other types of risks and other types of, uh, of, of trauma. And no different from other types of issues. I mean, look at the problems with uh, narrow definitions of the environment, you know, so the indigenous climate justice movement is pointed out and you see this with the, uh, you know, one of the key issues raised with the Keystone XL is that it wasn't just about the fact that, you know, the tar sands uh, is a source of dirty energy. That's one aspect of it, but it's tied to human trafficking and to sexual violence and to a lack of uh, consultation that reflects indigenous consent. It's tied to all these other issues. It's it's not an issue where you can just narrow in on a few environmental impacts so that, you know, to actually uh, uh, address the true injustice, you have to address, you know, patriarchy and you have to address uh, exploitation. You have to address a lack of respect for indigenous consent. Um, it's not just about stopping the the dirty energy industries um, and a society right where people live in fear that they're going to be abused when they live in fear that they're going to be severely economically exploited if they live in fear that they are not going to be consulted you know that's that's not a society that uh, you know is in a position where it can adapt to and respond to uh, risks that are, are coming its way and it can fend off colonial violence. So Kyle, uh, you know, the, the way you're talking about um, 
uh, collectives, reciprocity, kinship, and how central that is to uh, Indigenous culture and to Indigenous ways of understanding the world. And then tying that into environmental injustices and uh, how these are collective attacks that undermine uh, the resilience of collectives and communities and cultures or seek to undermine. Um, but I think you've also pointed out, certainly in terms of indigenous cultures, there's a, an enormous amount of resilience there. And and we've seen really in the last number of years a real resurgence. And one of the places that we see uh, indigenous activism so strongly is around the environment. Um, and so I want to ask you a question. Uh, there was a, an article that uh, I shared with you and that my students recently read on indigenous blockades. It was written by a non-indigenous author. Uh, it was published in the International Indigenous Policy Journal. It's called I Could Turn You to Stone, Indigenous Blockades in an Age of Climate Change. Uh, and in this piece, Patrick Canning of Vancouver Island University basically argues that non-Indigenous people and governments need to start taking seriously the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, uh, making rapid headway to protect both Indigenous rights uh, and the environment in the face of the climate crisis and other environmental crises or else they risk sort of a never-ending series of blockades as Indigenous people stand up against the destruction of the human and the more than human worlds uh, by, by capitalism and all the, the forces that are up against the world right now. My take on this, I, I appreciate the argument being made by a settler to settler governments, um, but I also wonder if this is putting a lot of onus on people often most marginalized within Western culture to now stand up against it. So I wonder what your thought is on the role that uh, Indigenous people are increasingly being asked to play, it seems, by environmentalists um, in these kind of conflicts, uh, often putting their lives and their own livelihoods on the line. Yeah, the issue you raise in the question is one that you know, I definitely have to deal with in a lot of different ways. You know, I feel that, and, and I don't necessarily know in its most recent form, you know, when it, it started, uh, but there's kind of been this emphasis that like the main kind of vehicle of indigenous resistance is the the blockade. And, you know, there, there's a couple of reasons, I think, to be kind of skeptical about, I don't know, I guess a certain way of... Um, you know, of talking about that. So for example, if somebody visits, uh, you know, an indigenous blockade, uh, it's probably the case that the indigenous people that are, you know, from the affected communities, uh, you know, probably don't refer to what they're doing as a, a blockade. And if you ask them what they're doing, you know, obviously in the case of a uh, uh, Standing Rock against the Dakota Access Pipeline, you know, famously referring to themselves as water protectors, and that that also had a gender dimension, uh, you know, to it as well in terms of the the activists being uh, women, two spirit people, and uh, you know, and other aspects of gender as well as it's connected to uh, human relationships with water and protectorship of water. Uh, and again, all of those speak to, to origin stories, to uh, numerous cultural traditions and ceremonies and, and memories that people have. Uh, and, and then if you ask individuals that are at a blockade, well, is, is all, is all that you do is, is blockade. Um, <laughs> they would say, well, no, <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and they'd unpack whole histories of work that they do at the cultural level, at the policy level, at the legal level, um, at the educational level, uh, at the level of the arts, you know, uh, and so a blockade is one piece among, you know, entire life histories where, you know, individuals have pursued change and transformation in a colonially hostile environment. Uh, and so in this way, uh, you know, I think it's it's important that even though blockades seem to invoke a certain type of awareness of indigenous power and resistance, that there are so many other you know legal reforms, social reforms, educational reforms that indigenous people have advocated for, and that actually all of those reforms need to keep going if something like consent is even going to be possible because. You know, consent is, is, and especially if we're thinking about it in a kinship model, it's one thing to be forced to 
respect somebody's consent. Uh, it's another thing to actually be in a society where consent is valued. And so we know that there are certain struggles with getting nation states to truly honor at the regulatory level the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indig- on the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, but we're even further away from actually having societies where bureaucrats, policymakers, scientists, and others, where they they actually value consent so much that they don't just see it as a requirement that uh, messes up the timeline of the different permitting projects or research projects or policy projects that they're they're part of. And so I think that really uh, people need to look at the blockades as as one aspect of indigenous organizing that is related already to a number of other aspects of organizing that have gone on for some time. And I think people also just need to be more aware of the the history of blockades. I mean, it seems to me that people have forgot about, you know, just in the, say, in the Canadian context, um, you know, all the different grassroots uh, indigenous activism, you know, whether it's New Chanolf people and the, the logging issues they face or, or you know, Haudenosaunee people and, and, and Oka and, uh, right? I mean, there's just, and it just seemed, and these weren't even that long ago, but it already seems like they're gone from, uh, uh, you know, from the, the collective memory of certain settler populations. So I'm going to turn the discussion uh, a little bit towards a a slightly different direction, because we did say at the outset, Kyle, that we were going to ask you about the uh, political shifts in the U.S. And so for listeners wondering, we're we're recording this at the beginning of March in 2021. And one of the biggest changes in terms of global environmental politics uh, relates to the the election of Joe Biden uh, not too many months ago. And, you know, as an example, um, we've talked about this with some of our, our guests, you know, on his first day in office uh, as the, the new president of the United States, um, Biden formally canned the Keystone XL pipeline. He rejoined the Paris Agreement and in the ensuing days instituted a whole range of, of uh, pro-climate policies and, and programs. Um, so clearly, you know, compared to Trump, uh, things are changing a lot at the political level uh, in terms of its approach to climate change uh, governance. But of course, Democratic presidents are not always environmentally progressive. And I guess I'm curious to hear your thoughts uh, as someone who, uh, you know, touching on what you were just talking about in the context of of environmental justice movements and indigenous environmental uh, movements in in the United States. Where do you see this going? What are your hopes and also your concerns um, for the Biden presidency? Yeah, you know, it can be challenging to talk about the the Democrats, you know, as a, a you know, as an organizer my myself, um, you know, it does get fairly frustrating that, you know, many of us actually participate quite uh heavily in efforts to increase votes for the, you know, the the Democrats given some of their, you know, environmental policies and uh other types of agenda items that we feel are certainly better than uh, some of the alternatives, right? But then once you get a successful democratic election, the actual communities that were there uh, uh, putting in the effort to win the vote, they just don't, you know, benefit in a way that's that's fair given how important their their votes have been. And so the you know the Democrats, I mean, the obviously a lot of Native people were were really pleased about the 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 effort by the Biden administration to stop the the Keystone XL, but you know we need to be watching about whether the Democrats are are actually going to make reforms at the level of what uh, tribes were were asking for with respect to that issue. You know, if you look, for example, at the the lawsuit uh, that included several tribes, including the Rosebud Sioux Tribe, that the the Native American Rights Fund stewarded. I mean, you know, if you look at the issues that were brought up in that, they they go way beyond just uh, dirty energy. I mean, they involved issues of the the labor and sexual exploitation of the the man camps and the the, the labor camps that kind of invade you know Native and other communities with the construction of of these pipelines. They were talking about the lack of consultation, the lack of fairness in environmental reviews, and and a continued bureaucratic inability to understand that tribal values are are not associated with just the the place where the shovel hits the dirt but refer to the integrity of entire landscapes and 
you know, the, the Democrats, they need to make change at, at that level. I mean, they it's not just about stopping the pipeline. There needs to be serious bureaucratic regulatory uh, uh, change that occurs. And I don't know that I, I can say that the Democrats are necessarily moving in that direction. Currently, absolutely, is there legislation, is there policy that's beginning to boil up where I've at least been part of conversations and dialogue and listening sessions and others where uh, certain Democratic leaders have said that they want that and are seeking input on on how to do it. Uh, but we don't know yet whether that's going to happen. And I think one of the first um, tests of that is going to be if infrastructure legislation moves forward, which I think in the next couple of months might become something that is you know in, in the public eye. And will that infrastructure you know build back better legislation actually create opportunities for tribes to be consulted, to exercise self-determination and emerge as leaders in the energy transition, to emerge as leaders in the changes to infrastructure that will be funded through that legislation. And that's very different from you know, just being beneficiaries of something through a little bit of an increase in dollars, but actually, will it create a condition where tribal self-determination is more central to how the United States moves forward? And I think if you can do that, right, then that means that there would be strong tribal consultation. Tribes would be able to exercise their own legal orders. Tribes would be able to determine at a much greater level of residency, what their values are in the land. Um, and anyways, I, I could go on, but I do not think that we yet know whether the Democrats are going to engage in that level of deep change or whether they're continue to operate at the surface. And, you know, they may continue to get native votes, uh, you know, in the future, given how problematic some of the alternatives are. Um, but I, I am holding out that the Biden-Harris administration uh, may yet do something different than previous Democratic administrations. Thanks, Kyle. It's, uh, yes, we're all sort of holding a, a crystal ball here, but it's really uh, it's really great to get your sense of what, what Indigenous uh, people and what self-determination requires of, uh, of the U.S. government moving forward. And, and hopefully the Biden-Harris administration will at least go as far down that path as as it can go, and uh, it'll be interesting to follow in the coming uh, months and years. Um, I want to ask you one last question. The question of justice and environmental justice is increasingly on the radar in the kind of environmental politics courses that Ryan and I teach. And many of our students, um, both undergraduate and graduate, are really interested in questions of how uh, environmental injustices affect Indigenous people and how Indigenous people are responding to that. When non-Indigenous students approach these questions, uh, you know, what's the guidance that you might give about how how to do it respectfully and maybe maybe what not to do, either in primary research worth working with uh, Indigenous students or even in general writing on Indigenous cases in their papers and so on. What are what what should students be paying attention to you? Yeah, as a, a professor, I I certainly uh, you know it's certainly part of the work that I do with students. And one thing I think is important um, is that a lot of times you know students enter into understanding of indigenous environmental justice issues solely as environmental issues. And if there were more courses that provided greater context for students to actually understand that if you're going to be an advocate of indigenous environmental justice, you also need to be an advocate of indigenous, you know, economic justice, indigenous gender justice, you know, uh, in indigenous justice for, for future generations, for, for children, uh, uh, healthcare justice, and that, you know, these distinctions like health versus the environment or, uh, you know, the economy versus the environment, you know, are not sort of indigenous ones and that students need to, to think carefully about, you know, what story are they, uh, you know, following. And, you know, the story that I would encourage people to follow is the larger story that, you know, indigenous people for, for generations have been working to recover and ad advance our governance at a lot of different levels, the cultural level, the social level, the economic level, the political level, and that students need to realize that they, you know, need to be part of that long haul and, and need to think about what they're doing at different levels and not uh, simply focus on the particular media that 
they initially got their information from like, you know, environment or economics. You know, another thing that's important is that oftentimes, you know, I think students think that the the main way that they can, you know, if they're non-Indigenous, they think, though, the main way that they can uh, support Indigenous uh, struggles is by somehow being a, a part of those exact um, struggles. And then they, they they wonder about ethical questions of their, you know, involvement or, or whether they have a, a, a savior complex. And and I would actually encourage, you know, folks to, to, and I guess this is kind of a kinship way of thinking about it, right, is that in a lot of Indigenous struggles, you have Indigenous community members that, you know, they're trying to protect their families, their their societies, or their cultures, and and so on. They're taking great risk to uh, to do so. Um, but you know, if you're not indigenous, you know, who's your family, and you know, what's the society that you come from? And you know, if, if they're not people that are needing of of protection, maybe they're they're people that are part of the the problem. And you know, what can you actually do? With an understanding of what indigenous people are saying and what they're communicating, but what can you do to change your own politics back home? You know, for students, it's really important to think. You know, is your interest in participating in indigenous struggle really an evasion of what might be responsibilities that one is better placed to do because it could be working with your own people? Um, and uh, and and I'd also say that for native folks, I mean, we've we've had to learn a foreign system. Uh, to survive and to sustain ourselves. We've, you know, nobody taught us how, you know, the Indian Act worked or, you know, how the the U.S. treaty system would would work. Um, uh, you, you know, nobody taught us that. We had to learn from the bottom up. And, you know, that's why a lot of, I think, Native folks, but also a lot of, you know, people of color in the U.S. and Canada get frustrated when students ask about, well, how can I be a good, a good ally? Because, um, you know, one, we're we're still trying to work out, you know, obviously what success looks like and, and what the solutions are. Um, and there certainly aren't kind of answers like, oh, this is is <laughs> is what you do. And, and and if we all did it, we'd be fine. Um, it's also the case that in our learning process, I mean, we're starting from the the bottom where we have, we have to figure out creatively um, how to survive and sustain our, our communities. And I think, you know, for someone to say that they are an ally, like genuinely, they have to be part of that struggle and they have to take up the challenges. They have to take up the burdens and they, they, they need to do it in a way that, that shows that they have that, that grit. Right. And so, you know, this is why I think sometimes, uh, you know, students are too quick to say that they're an ally. I think, like I said earlier, first people need to interrogate who they really are um, and, and who their community ties are and at what's preventing them from from operating on those particular relationships. And if people don't feel that they are kinship relationships, then what would it take to make them into kinship relations where there is consent and reciprocity? And so I think those types of things would go a long way towards supporting indigenous causes uh, and to supporting uh, indigenous well-being. Kyle, I think that last point about thinking about who we are, who we really are and where we, we come from is a good point to end. And it brings us back to the beginning uh, w- where you shared a little bit about your own background and, and where you're coming from and how that shapes your perspective. So you've been extremely generous uh, with us and sharing your expertise. Um, you started off by talking about the difference between being indigenous as a sort of a political identity and, and being a member of a given indigenous nation. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. I, I appreciated your discussion about colonization as a this you know fundamentally disruptive force, not just in terms of territorial disruption, but also disrupting cultural and political economic forms of interregional relationships. Um, and you also talked to, uh, at length about kinship networks, which seems really central and really was uh, formative for me, l- learning about that and hearing hearing about that from you. Um, and, and, you know, the model that I think kinship networks might offer in terms of uh, confronting looming global environmental challenges. So I really appreciated uh, this discussion. Uh, uh, of course, we, that, that wasn't all. We talked about environmental justice and, and also how uh, students and, and settler allies might engage with some of these issues in their own research. And of course, your, your hopes and concerns for a, a new democratic uh, president. So there was a lot there. But Kyle, thank you so much for, for joining us in this conversation.
Great. And thanks for hosting me, Ryan and Peter. I, I appreciate the chance to connect with you all and, and the students and, and others in your community. Well, it was uh, our pleasure. So I'm going to close out here with a, a reminder that the podcast is made available under a Creative Commons License 2.0. Uh, so we just ask that you provide appropriate attribution if you use the podcast, but please do use it. Uh, follow us on Twitter at EcopoliticsP with a capital P and get in touch. Our website is ecopoliticspodcast.ca. Uh, the Global Ecopolitics Podcast is produced by Nicole Bedford. Support with transcription and captioning is provided by Kika Mueller. And Adam Gibbard helps us with artistic design and digital support. So we'll see you all in our next episode and stay tuned. Stay tuned.